All right, guys, I got something fun here to show you today. Um, so uh, one of the things that we've been messing around with is combining uh, 3D printed parts um, with electrical testing equipment. Um, so specifically today we're going to talk about uh, pogo pin nests and uh, pogo pin guides. Uh, so before we get into uh, that, I got to explain some basic things to you so we're all kind of on the same page. So first thing I want to explain is uh, what is this doing? Um, so this is just a test cell that we built um, just to, to kind of show off all this stuff and help people understand kind of what we're doing and also to do the testing. Um, so what we have is we have some uh, uh, kind of uh, fake uh, lights that we made here. These are LEDs in 3D printed housings. And these just represent something that can be energized with electricity. Um, that's all this is. Uh, but out in industry, especially automated equipment, um, you know, vehicles aren't getting any less complicated. There's more and more electronics being put into vehicles. And basically when you get to the end of the line or maybe midway through an assembly line, um, you need to fully test your electronics that have been assembled into, oh, I don't know, door handles, bumpers, uh, lighting, um, you know, lighting sub-assemblies, anything like that. When it gets to the end of the line or even sometimes midway through the line, um, companies need to test those. And so what they do is they have to energize them. So they will take and they will make a little carriage or a, a plug-in or they'll put it on the end of a cylinder. Uh, sometimes they do it by hand. There's a million different ways to do it. But basically they make these, uh, these little testers and so when they come into contact, they'll energize the circuit. Then they could be doing data transfer, they could be pulling telemetry, they could just be turning on a light and looking at it with a vision system to make sure that the light is present and that it has the proper light characteristics like intensity and things like that. Um, and so what we have is inside of these little uh, guys right here, we have pogo pins. <clears throat> this is a pogo pin and it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a spring-loaded uh, pin that goes in and out um, and basically it's got a little cap on it and the idea is that this pin will come into contact with one half of your uh, plug and then, boy this is really hard to do looking through a camera, but basically comes into contact and uh, compresses and obviously you have one for either lead and when they touch they can energize this and these compress so that you can make sure you get a good solid connection with whatever you're trying to energize or pull data off of. Um, notoriously in the machine build and automation industry, these little guys right here can really, really suck to make. Um, you can see it's very long, uh, very long, and the holes are really small, and that pogo is sitting back inside of there like that. Um, and you can't really see it on these, but there is, oh, you can sort of see them kind of down in there. Uh, you can see the faces of the pogos down inside there. Um, and so these pieces are very difficult to make. Uh, you know, a machine builder uh, I've worked with for a long time always says, uh, if you need a good, if you need one good pogo pin nest, you're going to make three. Um, because they're just challenging. Also, you're limited to you know what CNC machining can do for how you can contour the outside of these. So if you have square channels or if you have weird features or anything like that, uh, machining these can be uh, a real pain in the butt. And there's actually companies out there that specialize in pretty much just making these uh, for uh, automation companies so that they don't have to mess with it. Um, another example of, uh, of uh, one of these parts uh, would be something like this right here. So <clears throat> this is one um, that I really like because you can see, I mean, look at all those frickin' holes in there and look at how thin the walls get. Um, I mean, we're talking very, very, very thin walls. On this side right here, I'll go back to grabbing my pointer. On this side right here, you're down to like a 16th of, or I'm sorry, a, a 16 thousandths thick walls. Um, so you know, it's always a challenge to make these and they are time consuming and expensive because you have to remake them so many times because you mess them up during machining. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked through um, the reason for a pogo tester, uh, let's actually talk about what our testing found. So obviously we did a bunch of testing, cycle testing to make sure that, you know, nothing was going to wear out as this was cycling. Um, <clears throat> and we came out good on that front. But, you know, one of the major questions that I've gotten from a lot of people is, 
what is the potential for crosstalk? Um, and so what is crosstalk? Crosstalk is essentially you have two pogos next to each other and you start to get um, you know, electrical signals uh, uh, conducting through the material between the pogos and actually influencing the results um, that you're getting back. So uh, kind of like a short circuit, I think. Again, not, I'm not an electrical engineer, so you know, I'm definitely playing way over my head. Um, but because I'm not an electrical engineer and because I'm playing way over my head, I reached out to some guys who are actually electrical engineers, and this is definitely not over their head. So uh, I reached out to my buddies uh, over at Magnum Engineering here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, these guys are phenomenal. Uh, they're like the you know DE forerunner of the electrical world. They have full in-house electrical engineering capabilities, um, and they actually have an in-house fab as well, where they actually have pick and place equipment and um, you know all this stuff to actually manufacture PCB boards and, and electrical assemblies in-house. These guys know <laughs> electrical. They know PCBs and they know pogo testers. Um, so I reached out to them and uh, I actually sent this guy along with some other samples over to them and they ran them uh, through some testing and wrote me up a really great report and sent it back over. Basically what they said is, hey, what you really want to you know, look at uh, is the dielectric uh, constant of the material. Uh, basically the conductivity of the material as I understand it. Um, so they needed a control, so they got uh, some parts made out of nylon 6.6, billet nylon 6.6, um, which is a material that they've used on uh, other electrical test equipment. Um, and then I gave them some parts out of 3D printed nylon, and they tested them at 10 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz. And basically they're looking for that crosstalk phenomenon. Um, and what they found is the uh, dielectric constant of the nylon 6.6 is uh, 3.6 and 3.3. And for the 3D printed nylon, it is 5.6 and 4.6. Um, and their uh, feedback on all of that is the 3D printed nylon shows a slightly higher dielectric constant, but is still well within an acceptable range for electronic test equipment. Um, talking further with them after that initial meeting, uh, or uh, this initial report, uh, basically they said, hey, if we were buying electrical test equipment and you were to build it out of this material, we would be totally fine with that. It would meet all of our requirements and you know we'd be good to go. So you don't have to just take the word of some goofy additive machine build engineer guy. Uh, you could take the word of some extremely, extremely skilled electrical engineers. Um, so that's kind of the, the long and short of the material and the testing that we've done to check on that crosstalk phenomenon. So, to put a bow on everything, uh, we've talked about the, uh, the cycle testing, uh, we've talked about the crosstalk. Um, why would you do this over machining these? Obviously, uh, these have been machined out of materials like nylon and uh, G10 and, and different things like that. Why, why look at something like this? Well, basically, you can get away with the as complex of geometry as you want. You know, we looked at that really thin wall example. We've looked at this example at how long these are. Um, you know, you can do square corners, you can do undercuts, you can do anything you, you want, essentially we can print it. We can break all the rules of CNC machining. Um, you know, the golden rule of additive manufacturing, I preach this and I scream it from the, the rooftops, complexity is free. It's size that will cost you. Well, here's the great thing. These aren't very big. You know, this part right here, not very big. Um, you know, for the most part, these types of parts are, are usually pretty small. Um, and, uh, and then if you've got a machine that has, you know, a couple of them on there, you know, you're just spreading that cost out across parts even more. So um, additive manufacturing is an absolute game changer for pogo pins. Um, We've got uh, many of them now out in the field with a couple of customers. Uh, I'm showing you some video here of uh, one actually running at our customer, uh, one of our customers. This has 1,500 cycles on it, no issues. Customers super happy with it. And um, you know we're gonna be doing a bunch more for these guys hopefully soon. So, um, so yeah, so early indications, everything looks really good with this. Uh, I think we've done the work to kind of prove it out. Um, both, you know, with real-world testing and some 
lab analysis from people who actually know about electronics and electronic test equipment.